Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. For this episode, I talked to Alan Vo. Along with his father, Hung, they are known online as The Coral Reef Tank, also found on Instagram as CRT underscore reefs. Alan is a recent Princeton University graduate majoring in operations research and financial engineering. There's a long thread going back to 2014 uh, when Alan was only 13 years old uh, on Reef to Reef called Some of My Acro Collection. And you can basically follow that thread and follow the journey of, of their tanks and systems and methodology. I learned quickly that Alan is obsessed with trying new things in the hobby, trying to improve every little aspect of what he does. And he is a very, very intelligent guy. And I definitely learned a lot in this conversation, including some things I would like to try applying in my own systems. Thanks to the direct support of hobbyist Bobby Heath, I'm happy to bring this podcast to you absolutely ad-free. If you want to support us, the best things you can do are like, share, write us a review, and definitely subscribe. Not enough people are hitting subscribe. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for future guests, please reach out. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Alan Bow of the one and only Coral Reef Tank. All right, All right. Alan. Alan, thanks for joining me, man. Awesome. Yeah, nice to meet you, Adam. Yeah, for sure. We First have... time on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, sweet. We have not really chatted before, so we've got probably a lot of stuff we can we can cover here for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so my understanding is you kind of got into reefing through your dad, who is also uh, like an expert uh, reef keeper as well. Is this kind of, uh, you guys kind of do this together? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, kind of born into this hobby, yeah. if you want to say that. Uh, always been around uh, saltwater aquariums my entire life. Uh, my dad had uh, 125 gallon when I was born and that tank is still running. So it's probably 20, I'm 22, so it's probably like 20, at least 22, 25 years old. Wow. Yeah. Were you always pretty fascinated by it? Like, did you kind of want to get involved pretty early on? Yeah. I mean, the, the story with, uh, how I got into the hobby really was, uh, I watched finding Nemo really young Yeah, (laughs) and, uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, probably like however old I was there. And I, I had a, a finding Nemo cap that I always took around with me everywhere. And uh, the worst worst part about that was I lost it when I went to Disney World when I was six. <laughs> and uh, I, mean, I mean, I miss it, but it turned out that I had a Nemo at home or a Confish at home. And, yeah. you know, I think that was a better substitute than the hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And your dad, um, I guess, has had quite a bit of good success, um, you know, with SPS. And and I, you know, I think I remember seeing a thread on Reef to Reef years ago where there was some pretty amazing looking acros um were you doing much at that point or was that kind of like at what point did you kind of get involved in the detailed I mean, part of it i mean funny story is i mean the entire reef to reef scene my dad's never really been on it so it's all yeah. been me okay okay so, I've, so yeah so i've i've been on the forums ever since i was like a little kid i was wow. on like reef central uh saltwaterfish.com if anyone remembers that yeah i was a uh, one of the, the old forums and then I joined Reef to Reef in like the early 2010s mm-hmm. and uh, I created a, it's like a progression thread. Uh, that's when we really started playing with SPS. Before it was like, you know, mixed reef, a lot of LPS, soft corals. Cause I mean, in like the early 2000s, that's all you could keep, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, we had metal halide starting off and the whole shebang, you know? So I've been through pretty much every little, like evolution of the hobby since like the 2000s yeah kind of like sitting here and watching it go through yeah same with me i started i think 2001 was around that the time i call it the brown ages the back in the old days the brown ages (laughs) oh man i do you remember when the rainbow acans first started showing up yeah they were uh yeah they were hot stuff those were (laughs) that was that's what really got me into the hobby we would uh there's a, a local store near here called aqua pros and he would always bring in like the most amazing coral and fish and uh, my dad would always take me 
with him there. And I mean, it was a fun time for me and him, you know, just mm-hmm. getting to see all these new corals that, you know, you probably never seen before because Australia was pretty, yeah, pretty new. Yeah. And uh, a, a lot of like corals, like Duncan's, these rainbow acans were just coming in. It were just amazing compared to like your like Nepthias, cold corals, you know, all those yeah. soft corals, Xenias, GSP, you know. So, I mean, that was like the one of like, the first things that really drew me into the hobby. Yeah. And once we got kind of comfortable with that, we started, you know, dabbling with SPS. And, uh, you know, I was just scrounging the forums at the time because I just couldn't keep them alive. And <laughs> look where we are now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's come a long way. And yeah, I mean, some of those early ACANs or Micromusa, I guess we call them now, um, those were some of the first like true rainbow type corals that I remember seeing, like with actual, you know, six or seven colors in the same in the same piece. So, I mean, there's a lot of corals that are called rainbow now that are, you know, pretty debatably rainbow. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, rainbow is a, I mean, somewhat overused term in the hobby, but I get it. It's what moves, it's what moves the corals. So Mm -hmm. it's true. Good marketing. So, um, as far as your, your guys' systems, um, I see there's kind of one main sort of frag. It kind of looks like a combination tank frag system. Are there other systems tied in? Like what's the kind of layout like? So we have six independent systems running right now. Oh, wow. um, so I have two full blown SPS, like main display tanks. Uh, I have my quarantine, like incoming system. And uh, I'm really setting up m- my third SPS display right now. Uh, that system crashed a few years ago and it was just always on the back burner because I was at school. Mm-hmm. Couldn't spend too much time, you know, I'd had like, maybe a month at home for the longest period of time. So, and I mean, it's hard to maintain all these systems with like a one man crew. So, I mean, this, uh, like, well, what about your dad operation? How, I mean, how yeah, he can, he, <laughs> I mean, he, he is a hardcore reefer. That's for sure. Yeah. He's been doing this ever since he was a kid. He's always been, uh, he was, uh, he's from Vietnam and, mm-hmm. uh, he lives really close to the ocean, probably like a five minute moped ride yeah. to straight, straight to the ocean. So he would always, you know, uh, catch fish, take them home. He's a big freshwater guy for a long time. Yeah. Koi's, arowanas. I mean, he, this was, I mean, I think it's just in our blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. It's a, you're definitely a, a, a reef uh, and fish baby for sure. <laughs> it's your generation. <laughs> yeah, that's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, you were telling me you uh, graduated from Princeton recently um, and I was kind of curious about, uh, I can't rem- remember what you said you were taking exactly, but, um, is, is there a way that you're going to tie your education into what you want to do with, with corals and reef keeping? Well, I majored in operations research and financial engineering. So, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, maybe the technical aspects of things don't quite align with mm-hmm. uh, reef keeping, but I mean, I chose the major because I had the least familiarity with it. And I really wanted just to challenge myself when I was at school, mm-hmm. learn something new that I probably couldn't learn anywhere else. You know, being able to go one of these like super prestigious universities was like a dream come true for me and my family. Yeah. yeah. So I just kind of, okay. I just kind of chose something where I was like, oh, I don't know anything. I might as well learn something here. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a very mathematical heavy major. So, it's not directly aligned with reefing, you could say, but what it really taught me was um, how to be very analytical and how to pretty much problem solve. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I guess that's why, um, I mean, I think that's where my application of my major can apply to the hobby. Yeah. You know, just like being very analytical, um, understanding what your root problem is, problem solving, and just kind of like iterating through what is works and what doesn't work uh, and so like how to like improve yourself you know pretty much yeah Yeah, no i think that's kind of people that that i seem to have the best success in this hobby are the the people that can break down and analyze you know the the potential causes for an issue and and kind Mm -hmm. of start start to figure things out um yeah is there is there would you say there's any um like direct changes you've made to a system before where you've really like noticed a positive result or change like in the health of the corals or Anything like that? Um, I think one of the first discoveries I can't, we kind of figured out was way back when when uh, Acro Power was introduced on the market. Mm-hmm. That was a crazy thing. No one really used aminos back then. And aminos definitely helped in the beginning. 
along with um, some of the KZ products. I've always been a big proponent of um, my Core 3 uh, Flatworm Stop Coral Booster and the Pulse Extra Special. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's one thing that kind of kept my, our success pretty steady. Because, I mean, a lot of these systems or a lot of Aquarius don't really realize what they're putting in their tank and what rates of uh, these elements are depleting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't, you don't know what's uh, in those blue bottles as well. But just putting in something in your tank that has like whatever in there during a time where ICP testing wasn't a thing mm-hmm. and most test kits weren't the most accurate definitely helped because, I mean, we were putting in those trace elements without knowing pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And I've always like – um and then since ICP testing uh, was introduced, I always noticed my numbers were pretty great. Yeah. And I, it wasn't like I was, you know, running like reef moonshiners because that didn't exist at the time. So I, it probably was just from those blue bottles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I mean, uh, I've wondered about those bottles recently and um, a couple of people have actually ICP'd the flatworm stop. So mm-hmm. um, and I wasn't surprised. It has a lot of potassium, a lot of magnesium. Yep. A fair bit of iodine, uh, yep. a fair bit of manganese, and I had, had consistently had high iodine and manganese um, on about the last three ICPs. So I cut back on my flatworm stop. Um, so and, how much do you dose? Well, I was dosing ten mils a day on about three hundred and fifty gallons. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is still lower than I think what the recommended dose is. Yeah, but I like, mean, I don't. It's a pro- prophylactic dose, right? It's like a dose that's mm-hmm. just to maintain the corals. It's not for flatworms, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think flatworm stop will straight out destroy like a flatworm population or issue. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, seen, it it'll make your corals very strong, probably just due to like these um, elemental deficiencies that we don't know about. Yeah, you know, you're not like currently like you're not twenty four seven running ICPs on your system, so you don't know. Yeah. So you're just putting in that, you know, remedial dose and your corals are absorbing it and they're getting healthier and you just kind of see it with your eyes and you're like, oh, it works. So might yeah. as well keep on going. But like when when you really get to it and your your system is like super densely populated, I mean, those numbers are just sucked up instantaneously. Yeah. So yeah. there you, you just kind of have to keep up with your elements. Yeah. And I think that's why the Moonshiners... Um, some people have really good success with it is is the daily dosing of some of those elements that get depleted faster. Oh yeah. You know, it's that it's a similar concept with the KZ system, the Zubit mm-hmm. system. It's that daily like maintenance and like paying attention to your system. Yeah. If you yeah. can, if you can have that type of diligence and dedication and, you know, determination to like make your dreams come true and like get <laughs> your system to like this ideal, like utopia. I mean, Obviously, you know, you'll find your ways around it and, you know, it works. Yeah. Yeah. So you haven't noticed. So dosing those those blue bottles, you haven't noticed any particular elements um, elevated on ICPs, like anything get kind Um, of in a past natural seawater range? Nothing in particular that makes me nervous or scared. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let me check my latest ICP. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't sent one out in a in a little bit but um, and i've had high see. vanadium and high manganese on my last couple tests and talked to a couple people about it and it doesn't seem to be um they don't seem to be a huge concern as far as being elements that are a bit out of the range yeah I've, i think i've noticed vanadium in the past i just couldn't figure out where it was coming from probably from the blue bottles as well mm-hmm. Uh, yeah and somebody yeah, I, uh, mentioned a scientific paper uh to me recently because i was asking about my vanadium accumulation and he said that apparently detritus holds vanadium it really wants to bind into detritus and so it could be potentially you know held in there and leaching out over time if if you have a, a overabundance of it so um something oh. to, to look into i'm i'm curious about that but uh yeah, not not sure here. Mm-hmm. I just uh, loaded up my latest ICP. I'll send it. I'll send it in your the chat just so you can take a peek yeah, at sure. that. All right, but um, but yeah, I think uh, I've been using ATI ICPs for a good bit now. Yeah, always had good results with those. Yeah, 
Um, are there any particular elements you kind of, I mean, I'm talking trace, not so much like, obviously, we probably both consider potassium and iodine two of the most important sort of sometimes called trace, but they're more of a major element. Um, any trace elements you'd say you would pay more attention to than others? Yeah. Um, one of my friends, a good friend of mine, Anan Paimal, mm-hmm. he's another. Yeah, he's, uh, he's supposed to be on here, actually, too. <laughs> soon. Oh, yeah. yeah, awesome. I mean, there are a few really like uh, OG reefers in my area. There's Ryan, there's Anan, there's a handful of others that have come and gone. Mm-hmm. But uh, Anan had brought up something about fluorine to me a while back. Mm-hmm. And I had always noticed at that time I was running Red Sea Coral Pro Salt. And I'd always noticed near zero iodine and pretty low fluorine. So I was really confused at what was happening and uh, kind of went on like a rabbit hole. And uh, I found that I think the Red Sea Coral Pro Salt has somewhat lower fluorine levels than I would like. Mm-hmm. And I decided to look around for a different salt mix. I originally... I think I'd say the best success I had with my SPS systems was either using reef crystals, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, I mean, that's a common ground for a lot of SPS guys and uh, salinity salt by Aqua Vitro. Okay. Uh, That was another good salt that I used. But lately I hopped on to NIOS, their salt, because I found some spreadsheet somewhere. Someone had compiled the ICP test of, a lot of the major salt brands. Yeah, yeah. I think I found that Nios had the highest level of fluorine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so I switched over to that and I've noticed better. Uh, I'm only like halfway through the bag, so but I have noticed like better uh, tissue on my SPS. Mm-hmm. And you haven't been switching dosing, over. You haven't been dosing fluorine. Um, you oh, just, I, you I, I, yeah. I dose the three elements that I dose consistently. Mm-hmm. on their own are fluorine, iodine, and strontium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Those are the three things that I manually dose because those seem to be depleted on their own without any, like, even with all the products that I put in my system, that's, those are the three, you know, canaries that always drop down. Yeah. So I always try and keep those numbers a little elevated because I mean, iodine is depleted very fast in our system. Yeah. Fluorine, there has not been too much research from my experience. It's more of a recent discovery. And then the strontium is, you know, strontium. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And something I, the ICPs that I use are the Fauna Marin. And they, if you do the total ICP, it actually gives you a ratio relationship between iodine and flor- fluoride. Um, which right. I, I guess those two elements kind of have a, like a synergetic kind of balance between the two of them. So. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds like something that is definitely worth paying attention to if you consider how important we know that iodine is for the biological processes. Um, like you Mm got to assume that fluoride's got to be a big part of that too. And we say fluorine, we're talking about the element itself, but the bioavailable form in our tanks is fluoride. Fluorine, I think is actually a gas that's highly Mm -hmm. toxic. (laughs) We don't want it in our tanks. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, a lot of these like elements are quite toxic in high doses so you got to be pretty careful if you're going to go and say like oh i can diy this myself i, I mean i'd rather just get the solution yeah, um, yeah i use i use um me corals for my like those trace elements because mm-hmm. they're a uh, pharmaceutical grade and uh they come in a nice little dropper that i can just kind of th- supplement every day so sorry what what brand is this me coral Okay. Yeah, I don't know about it, yeah. but I'll, I'll put a link in the in the show notes as I do when we. Yeah, bring Mark up. is also a great guy. I mean, if uh, anyone pays attention, you'll probably notice some of my pictures on his products as well. Oh, cool. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll give him a shout out. Um, I didn't see. Uh, I'm because I'm new to Zoom here. Um, I didn't see your ICP. Is there like a messaging area in it? Yeah, right where the share screen is. There should be a chat. Um... Or maybe I can send Share it again. Screen. Oh, chat. I see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's. I'm gonna take a look at it just because I just got mine, so we can kind of do a little bit of a comparison here, which could be. Yeah, and I think this this um, this test. Oh, it wants taken, me to log right? in. <laughs> hmm? It wants me to log in. Oh um, um, yeah, I, I'll do it. Yeah. But yeah. um, this this ICP test, I sent it out right after I started making my uh, concoction. 
that I've been kind of like posting yeah. on Reef to Reef about. Mm-hmm. So you will, if uh, if you notice um, my phosphorus and nitrate. Well, let's uh, are... let's see if I can get because I don't have an ATI account. I've never done an ICP with them actually. So let's. Can you oh, send okay. me a screenshot of it or something like that? We can edit this out too. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. No. No worries. But um, yeah. here, let me just uh, send a screenshot in chat. But yeah, you'll notice that um, my nutrient levels are ridiculous for an SPS system. Yeah. My, this test read 56 ppm nitrate, which is, whoa, you know, that's for crazy. some people, <laughs> yeah, for some, for some people, they're like, whoa, what the hell are you doing? Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can kind of see the proof in the pudding in my, yeah. uh, in my documentation of everything. And I've gone through a uh, pretty, in-depth detail on my reef to reef thread about my logic mm-hmm. and just like my rationale behind everything. So anyone can just kind of visit that and take a peek. I've linked some scientific articles in there. Um, a lot of the literature kind of points to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I've just mm-hmm. kind of like picked apart these uh, articles and just kind of applied what, you know, these findings to my systems and, you know, it works. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I see your nitrates at 56 and then your phosphates at 0.42 milligrams per liter. That's actually pretty close to uh, 100 to 1. Like it's not super far off from if we're going to look at the sort of nitrate phosphate ratio and kind of go on that sort of standard. Mm-hmm. Um, that yeah. seems to be what works for a lot of people's tanks. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I think my I recently uh, tested my nitrates and phosphates again. Uh, so I have a, the HANA phosphorus checker, the ultra low phosphorus checker. Mm-hmm. And I think I bought it at the time where I was running a ULNS system, like super low nutrients. So it was applic- applicable then. But now I just can't even measure my phosphorus yeah. anymore. It's just off the chart. So I, I don't even bother. But yeah. my, uh, my nitrate test uh, read at 35 ppm. Yeah. And that was like two days ago. So, yeah. I mean, you can, uh, and when I was really dosing the concoction, eat the nitrate and phosphate consumption was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I think I saw a 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 ppm decrease in phosphate in a day. Wow. Wow. So this is, yeah, this is one day. So, yeah. I mean that people are trying to like reduce this, like kind of seems like a miracle that your, your system can process that much nutrients in one day. Yeah, that is pretty wild. Like, I mean, obviously your, your corals per gallon is, it's probably a lot of mouths to feed, but um, oh yeah yeah but but still i mean that's uh it's way way more elevated than where i'm running um but one thing i would ask is um because your nutrients are elevated from feeding um versus you know some systems like for for me for example i have to add phosphate and nitrate to my systems but i don't think that's nearly the same as 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 getting those nutrients available via feeding um, like what's yeah. your experience on that? Yeah. Um, a lot of people are lately have been talking about organic and inorganic sources of nitrate and nitrogen. Mm-hmm. And if you really think about it, what are you doing by, let's say like putting in nitrate into your system, you're pouring the, le- like the final product of the nitrogen cycle the process. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's the least effective form for if you think about it, it has to be broken down from ammonia multiple times just to get this mm-hmm. compound, right? So if we think about it like this, or I kind of, uh, a lot of things that I do in the hobby, I try and make analogies and kind of like express this to people so that they can kind of understand it a little better. I mean, it, it's basically just diet, right? If you eat very raw organic foods full of nutrients versus a processed food, like chips or whatever, you can literally feel it in your body. You'll mm-hmm. feel sluggish. You'll feel weaker. You just won't feel the same. Mm-hmm. So what I try and do in my systems is I try and feed pretty much the raw source of whatever I can. And then through that, I try and eliminate all of the excess buildup of all the decomposition and the nutrients through bacteria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. And that's how I am, you know, able to have these ridiculous nitrate, like, fluctuations Mm -hmm. it's through the bacteria utilizing it and then the coral you know get all the nitrogen and phosphorus through the bacteria 
Yeah. So the bacteria right. is like the delivery system to the coral. Yeah. Basically. It's like it's the vehicle, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, your, bac- your bacteria is your Uber and all the nitrogen and phosphates are your passengers. Right? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Um, so do you want to kind of get into a little bit of detail on this um, feeding regimen? My understanding from what um, Ryan told me about it, um, Chummingham's Reef, is uh, uh-huh. it's sort of almost like almost like a... I don't know, it's like a, a monstrosity. Fer- fermented, <laughs> fermented mix of various foods. Um, so yep. yeah, I'll let you uh, <laughs> break it down a little bit. I mean, you can definitely smell it. It doesn't smell the same upon mixing, and then a few hours later, let me tell you that. Yeah, you definitely don't want to. You definitely don't want to take a whiff of it after a few, like eight hours. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of products and I'll say this before anyone else that like hops on my train goes out and rushes to buy these things. I do not recommend it for everyone. The only reason I can get away with this is because of how densely populated my systems are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you don't have the mouths to feed, why are you putting on all this stuff? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And coral growth is so exponential. I think sometimes people don't realize, um, you know, a system full of a few frags versus, a few colonies like one of my one of my larger colonies could be the coral coral volume of one person's entire tank you know one of my larger colonies just based on the polyps and you know like that that alone so um so kind of what do you want to reveal what are some of the products that are that are in it and kind of how the process works i mean it's on reef to reef i'm I'm very open with everything that i use in my systems but um it's basically a combination of all the products that i use I just mix it up before I put it in my tank. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, there's Fauna Marin products. There's KZ products. Um, there's some uh, Aquaforge products, Reefroids. You know, I mean, basically what it boils down to is a particulate food, uh, amino acids, mm-hmm. some trace uh, element compounds, bacteria, and a carbon source. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So basically once you put all this stuff in, you know, a container and kind of let it marinate, the bacteria will kind of get out of the dormant state and start multiplying. Right. And they'll start breaking down all the food in the water. Cause it's just in so much abundance in this mm-hmm. like little container so that the populations really like can like explode. And uh, you'll notice if you do mix everything together, um, you'll notice a fizzing reaction mm, interesting. when you shake everything up. So, and I think I contribute that to the KZ Zeozyme because I made my I made a few iterations of this concoction, mm-hmm. and uh, without the Zeozyme, you don't see that reaction. And mm-hmm. the Zeozyme is uh, postured as a enzyme, pretty much to decompose rot- rotting material and mm-hmm. decaying matter in your system. So I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. But since we isolate it in this like little container, it basically digests all the particulate food and making it more accessible to the bacteria. And this is my logic. I'm not sure if it's completely true, Mm -hmm. but it seems to be working and the effects are definitely noticeable in the tank due to all the fluctuations in the nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you've really noticed um, like feeding response, polyp extension, color increase, like what are the kind of, Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. Hmm. If um, there's a video on my Instagram where I recorded one of my speciosas after I poured the food in. You can see so much like mass material, like filaments on that colony. You've probably never seen that reaction before. And I I can stimulate this like on demand. Mm-hmm. I pour, mm-hmm. I, if I pour this like concoction in the tank, every acro in my tank will show some sort of feeding response. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't get that with a lot of like, you know, like the other particulate foods just on their own. If you pour like maybe like a spoon, of reefroids or benepets or whatever, you're not going to get it from your acros. No, I you might get it from your LPS. I mean, but those things are just always hungry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but your, your acros need a more uh, specialized food. Yeah. And I think uh, one, I was listening somewhere else and the concept of marine snow. And I think basically what I'm making is my homemade marine snow mm-hmm. pretty much with more v- v- variety in it probably as yeah, far as you know may, yeah who knows but yeah i mean basically that's how you you got to feed your corals there's your tanks are so nutrient deprived that you you have to feed your corals once they get to this like level of biomass mm-hmm. and i have a super like densely populated like aquarium as well there's tons of fish tons of acros just tons of life 
Yeah. So you, there's so many mouths to feed. And if you think about it, you're going to starve. You're going to go hungry and you're going to get weak. You're going to get sick and you're going to die if you don't eat. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that with my acros as well. I mean, before I've noticed, before I really like got into like feeding my corals, I would notice like fluctuations in their health. Sometimes they'd be really, really intensely colored, super rich. And then after a while, uh, maybe I got a little busy or something and I didn't have enough time to do maintenance. The colors would fade. Yeah. You know, well, why? What happened? I mean, I should be, you know, in the good zone. I run a calcium reactor. I still dose all the trace elements and stuff. It's just because they're, they're hungry, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know for sure. It's, uh, I think probably under talked about how much uh, corals feed. And I think part of it too, for me is that like watching the feeding response to things like refroids, and I'm not trying to, you know, talk down any of these other products, but I haven't really seen uh, with SPS, I haven't really seen a polyp like take in any of that particulate or seem to have a really like, like obvious feeding response to it. Um, right. So I would be curious um, with your system, like you say, um, I mean, even like you said, speciosa, which are, um, you know, a more difficult they, um, acro to keep yeah, from Malaysia. Pain in the butt, man. Pain um, in the butt. But you've, it seems like based on some of the photos I've seen, you've had good success with them. Um, like, what's the amount of time you've been able to keep them for? Um, I think my oldest piece is running around two years right now. Yeah. But I mean, the the thing with these speciosas, I mean, they're a lot like, they're very similar to like the Aussie Echinatas. If you ever had experience with those, yeah. they'll look amazing and then they'll just peel. Which yeah. is the most like mind boggling head scratching issue because like everything else is fine. It's only speciosis. Yeah. And they are like my, my one that, uh, you know, it's what's keeping me in the hobby <laughs> trying <laughs> to figure out this issue, you know? Yeah. But it, they are a challenge to keep. That's for sure. But I've seen a lot of, I mean, I don't know about a lot, but I've seen a few examples of like spectacular colonies, super healthy. And uh, I just don't know what it is yet. I mean, I definitely think feeding is very important. These deeper water acros definitely consume a lot of food, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, just from like the, the nutrient swells and the plankton that they're in their environment, you have to replicate that in your system somehow if you yeah. want to have long-term success. Yeah. 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 And actually Farmer Ty, when he was on the podcast, made a point um, that he seems to think that certain corals from certain regions, if you just keep them together, they seem to do better. Um, I yeah. don't know if you've noticed that or all at, or kept any corals from say Aussie in different tanks before, but there could be some mixing of bacteria strains or something going on. That's not favorable. Yeah. That is, um, from the literature that I have read, um, there is a noticeable difference of what bacteria choose, uh, which bacteria choose to be on the coral depending on the region. Mm-hmm. Um, so there definitely could be like a incompatibility issue right there. Um, and I've always noticed with a lot of wholesalers as well, whenever they get shipments in, um, they'll isolate them by region. So you'll have an Aussie holding tank, an Indo holding tank and whatever. And they always keep them together for some reason. And, you know, in their short amount of time at these wholesalers, they don't have massive die off. Mm-hmm. You would think, you know, especially with, all the the issues with transit and stuff, you would think like, oh, you're getting a coral that's been in a bag for 48 hours. It's going to peel, right? No, mm-hmm. they don't have that. They don't have that issue. It might look like dookie for a week or two, but yeah. they usually typically, you know, color up and look very healthy within a few weeks. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's because most of the time they've come from, you know, been collected from the ocean, which you yeah. know, should be fairly ideal conditions. <laughs> um, and then they usually, they're in those uh, packing facilities, I think less than a week. It's usually only a few yeah. days before they're packed. Um, but uh, I definitely, I've talked to quite a few people about this recently. Um, we feel like there are some funky strains of bacteria um, that are coming in on the Indo pieces, especially the maricultured stuff, which is pretty much the majority of Indo for SPS now. Um, that's been causing some funky issues. Um, some of the darkening of the inner branches of some of my Acropora. Um, and uh, at this point, just based on uh, trying to make a few different changes, uh, I I think without a question, I would say that it, it's a strain of bacteria. Um, and I pretty sure it started we started seeing this more when indo opened up again in 2020 yeah um well here's an idea that i might have a lot of these mariculture farms are 
situated right off the shore just for easy access for these people, right? Yeah. To, to take them back. And, you know, there's a lot of waste water runoff going straight, you know, around those areas. So it could be just, you know, just like some nasty bacteria that is taking advantage. And those corals are, in the ocean are probably very strong. Yeah. They're able to fight it off or whatever. And then once they're in your system, those uh, nasty bacteria strains can take advantage and exploit the weak coral. And if your tank is mostly filled with aquaculture corals, they probably haven't experienced these issues before, you know? Yeah. It's like when uh, explorers came to the new world, right? Mm -hmm. And all the indigenous people were felt ill just due to illnesses that they've mm -hmm. never experienced before and their immune systems just weren't prepped for it. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of similarities. That yeah. It's fun. I use the same analogy in, in, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I use the same analogy yeah, there's with a, farmer Ty. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of uh, similarities just in like human history and you can apply it to like corals as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, for sure. Um, I, I agree too, as far as the farms, um, because I was at uh, a farm in Sarangan, um, Bali, uh, last in February this year. And, um, when I got there, it was not the ideal time. We kind of missed the lower tide. Um, but it was like murky and turbulent and pretty dark actually. And, and, and this was during the kind of rainy season. So, um, you know, it seemed like these corals were going through a lot on a pretty regular basis, especially during that time of year. It's not crystal clear, you know, perfection, like, you know, we kind of have in our tanks and it kind of got me thinking like, should we put more variety into our tanks as far as like having, you know, a darker couple days here or there, a day where we feed way heavier one day and then, you know, a little lighter for another day? Like, what do, what do you think about consistency versus, you know, variation and benefit from that? I, um, there, are, there are multiple facets to this question. Um, consistency, for one, is good, but being too consistent can also lead to issues. Uh, these corals in the wild, they experience massive influxes of nutrients just from the planktonic blooms that happen. So mm -hmm. that's not consistent, right? No. Yeah. It's so these too. corals are, yeah. And you can also see it in your corals. They only react to certain stimuli when rent, like, uh, they don't do it all, all the time. Like the feeding response, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see your, your, your corals always feeding. They only do it when the, the food is present in their environment mm -hmm. and there are so many things that we've probably never noticed a lot of invisible reactions and cycles and processes that we just can't see with our eye and we're just contributing our coral losses to who uh, who knows you know yeah. there are a lot of invisible things that we have to we can't account for and we're just continually learning yeah so i definitely think that consistency in let's say your parameters that's fairly important yeah. keeping staple calcium alkalinity magnesium all your elements like that see that's important but consistent feeding probably is also important as well and there are also times where you can or should overfeed just you know to get that boost to like let's say like the runt coral in your system you know yeah the one that doesn't get any food because it's just being out competed by your bigger colonies or whatever yeah just so you can like provide them with some sort of nutrients and, you know, to accommodate that, you also have to be ready to export all the waste. So you have mm -hmm. to be ready to have like a skimmer, perfugium, water change, whatever. Yeah. Be ready on hand. Yeah. And, um, and I think that I'm able to kind of like exploit this due to the amount of bacteria that I put in the tank, like the Zeobac, the Aquaforest products, the, the Fauna Marin product. It's like, you know, that's the only way you can kind of keep these systems in check. And there are a lot of uh, similarities with wastewater treatment as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. Uh, so we just got cut off um, from a time thing here, but yeah, I remember where we were. So um, I was going to talk about bacteria because you, that's kind of where we were at. Um, I think I would say, in my experience, like a lot of the time that we start to have, uh, assuming we have stable parameters and, and nutrients in a good range. Um, I think when a lot of systems start to have issues, it is related to bacteria. Um, yeah, you know, these a lot invisible of microbes rule the world, man. Yeah, and it's um, it's just little little subtle things like um, you know, I thought for a while um, 
I was losing some of the metallic pigment in the base of some of the corals that should have that kind of green fluorescent kind of proteins. Um, yeah. And I actually think it has more to do with bacteria than it does to do with trace elements because I experimented by raising my iron and really kind of putting some work into that, um, paying a lot more attention to some of those metals, and I didn't see any difference. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's little things like that. But um, do you ever hit um, your system or your corals with any any antibiotics? It's kind of a, a controversial topic right now, <laughs> hot topic. Yeah, so... I think I'll go back to something you said a little earlier. Uh, I think that loss of fluorescence is probably due to a bacterial population decline. So a lot of these trace elements, the corals can't directly use, right? Mm -hmm. And they have to get them through some, through their food, right? And you can't use these inorganic uh, elements directly. So the corals have to utilize it through the bacteria and the bacteria assimilate these uh, elements in their body or in the, in their cell mm -hmm. and the corals eat them and they're able to use it in a more usable form. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. And, you know, I, you know, I, I do see color fluctuations in my corals. I think it's just due to, you know, the population in the, in the tank. Once these uh, bacteria get to like a low number, they're just, there's just less available food in the nutrient in mm -hmm. the system, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially a super packed system. Um, and like, I guess as far as, you know, I've heard theories like, well, it's the zooxanthellae that's the, producing some of those pigments. But as far as I understand, zooxanthellae is is just brown. Like, no matter what, it's brown. I, there might be some subtle variations of it, but... Um, yeah. The, yeah. There are a lot of other things that produce pigments in the corals, uh, other other symbiotic relationships that I'm not too familiar with, but I think someone, I think someone was talking about leaves in one of their, mm -hmm. in one of their talks. Yeah. Lou, how, Lou did a, Lou from Fauna or Tropic Marin did a really interesting talk about that. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same. It's totally the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes for the same reason. Like I've seen systems that um, produce a lot of metallic pigments um, and that could be like a bacterial composition thing as well yeah actually, um, you know actually in my one of my systems i i really don't do much to it but the colors are probably the best mm -hmm. and i'm running like older uh radeon g3s and g4s on it and but like anything i put in that system like the colors are just metallic they shine through the water and yeah. it's it's crazy yeah. So it's it's definitely something to do with um, the bacterial population because my ICP just come back. They're all within ranges of each other that I, you know, they're all similar. Nothing that would extent, surprise plus you. Or minus yeah. Like, yeah, like plus or minus, like maybe like 10 percent or whatever. But it's something that we're not testing for at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you ever done uh, one of those microbiome tests? No, I have not. Yeah. I've. Uh, to be honest, I was waiting for it to get more established and more results. So it became more reliable mm -hmm. being like an initial adopter of one of those. You might not have gotten the most accurate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the sample. problems is you kind of need yeah. to support it to get that database strong in the first place. So almost yeah, consider it like a reef, true. a reef charity that you're supporting because <laughs> it's going to pay off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it definitely is on my uh, to-do list to yeah. get one of those microbiome tests coming up. But, um, I will say that since I started dosing my concoction, well, mm -hmm. when I was dosing it religiously, like once a week, two times a week, maybe three times a week, it knocked out all like any like film algae in the tank died or like mm -hmm. my rocks became very clean. Yeah. It was like a little fuzz, but like, it's like this pristine rock. Right. And I had some cyano at the time, but the cyano died off. Wow. And I wow. think I, I attribute that to like the, the slurry of bacteria products that I put in that uh, increase the competition in the system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and w which bacteria products are in the concoction? Um, I use, I use three, uh, the Zeobac, the Aquaforest stuff and the rebiotic by Fauna Marin. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I also use the, the Zeozyme. Yeah. Which is the, the enzyme, which is supposed to like speed up uh, the metabolic processes. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what is uh, being used. And, you know, if you were just to feed 
coral foods and aminos on their own, you would create a devastating algae bloom in mm-hmm. your tank and probably just crash it. Like uh, I think Ryan was talking about it. Uh, I'm turned his tank into milk, you know, yeah. essentially. <laughs> but uh, I, but but his system is amazing now, yeah. according to what he told me. And I mean, my system looked way better than before. Yeah. And just to kind of like test out my hypothesis that this concoction was really like behind this success, I went off of it for a month. Yeah. And yeah. I I noticed decline. Yeah. I noticed like a decline in just like the health and all my tanks. Um, so I started using the concoction in the summer and over here in Chicago, it's starting to change over to the seasons. Mm-hmm. And I always noticed like a seasonal issue that happens with my systems. So once I hopped off the, um, the concoction, all my tanks had a cyano bloom, even the tanks that um, are like, supposed like supposedly perfect looking Mm -hmm. and i had a cyano bloom and i had some issues and i lost some pieces and then once i started using the concoction again the cyano died off Mm -hmm. and the corals looked better yeah and you were were you were probably feeding less during this time that you were you had taken off or or would you say just replaced with something a different regimen so i what i did is i still used all the same products but not the technique was different so i went back to manually dosing everything by hand Mm-hmm. and not and you know sometimes you miss out on something or you're in a rush and you don't put in you know all the time that you're supposed to put into it maybe you forget something you forget to feed it for a day or whatever and you know i think that's what kind of caused the issue because like you know you're like mismatching everything here and you kind of hodgepodge do this for a day that for the next day so the corals don't get everything they need mm-hmm. when they need it Mm -hmm. right they'll have like one thing go up and then the other one's going down and then this one will go up and then this one will go down so you'll have that like bouncing around fluctuation in your system and your corals definitely don't need like that i mean you you definitely wouldn't like that too if you were like let's say just forced to eat vegetables for a week and Mm -hmm. then you're just forced to eat meat for a week and you know just cycling through it like that it's not the most ideal so if you're able to supply your corals with everything they need consistently i mean i think that's um, that's what it yeah it goes back to consistency, right? Yeah, I mean, I would say as long as your fundamental needs are met, um, you know, you're okay to have a day here or there that has a little more, or a day here or there that's a little less. But if the average is is on, then that's probably okay because we all are going to miss a day here and there, yeah, or, or whatever, yeah, you know, and yeah, that, and what, yeah, and what's really important is like following trends in your system. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see like any drastic jump up or down that you definitely know something's up. Uh, And there's also, uh, I wanted to say something else. Maybe I'll come back to it. I forgot. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, especially with feeding and nutrients and, and um, the nutrient ratios, I I do find like I noticed the effect on elk consumption, Um, you know, with a super loaded system, you probably noticed this too, is you can really identify what something's doing sometimes by just watching that alkalinity change. Assuming you're doing, uh, you have like an alkalinity tester automating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I do it by hand. I use a shallow for a test kit. But yeah. what I will say is when I, I started dosing the concoction, my calcium dropped. Mm, dropped like that. It, it went to like from 440 to like 360. Hmm. And at that time, I noticed literally every acro in my system exploded with growth. Huh. It's like everything just became super bushy. Like so many new growth spurts were coming out on everything. I was like, wow, this is really working. And I never test my calcium because I have a calcium reactor and yeah. I think it's fine. So I was just measuring my alkalinity that yeah. had always been pretty stable. And Ooh. next time I tested my calcium, man, it had dropped like hell. Yeah. How low did it get? 360. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not scary range, but, uh, yeah, Chummingham's was telling me, uh, his calcium got down to like 260 or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah. Calcium is not a big mover in my, in my, uh, experience, especially if you're running a calcium reactor in Cal. Yeah. That's that's what I'm doing. So even with that, seeing a reading of 360 for calcium is pretty shocking. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that some of those numbers, magnesium, calcium, like if there's like 
I don't know if there's like enough in the water, the corals are going to find it. They're not going to have to look too hard to, to pull those yeah. ele elements in because it's in, yeah, it's in, uh, what is it? Uh, it's, it's in abundance. Yeah. It's, it's in a, enough abundance that it's, it's there, but yeah, you really want to ensure the availability. It's probably, probably, uh, doesn't hurt, but, um, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Another important topic, I guess you could, you could kind of delve on is like availability. That's yeah. very important. In your system, we're always trying to keep this type of equilibrium or create like this optimal environment for whatever needs we have for our hobby, right? And we kind of have to set these expectations and goals for ourselves. And what do we, we kind of have to like sit down and be like, what do I want from this? And what do I want to achieve? And how do I achieve it? You kind of have to like work yourself in this kind of framework and approach your situations and issues like that, mm -hmm. you know, and availability is so crucial because let's say you can overfeed and everything will be in abundance for a short amount of time and then it'll drop because everything was used to this. Um, there's a very uh, famous or uh, scientific study. Think about lynxes and hares, mm -hmm. right? Population boom cycles, uh, population booms and bust. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that when, one thing, when your prey is in abundance, right, your predators will slowly increase their population mm -hmm. until the point where there are too many predators and not enough prey, and the predators will die out, mm -hmm. and then the prey will start uh, increasing again. So that fluctuation is pretty much what is happening in our system yeah. with your yeah. daily food intake and your feeding, your corals, everything. Mm -hmm. and so if you don't pay attention... And a lot of these things, I mean, it's easy not to pay attention because they're invisible. These these microbes, you can't see them with your eye. Mm -hmm. And you can only tell that you're, oh, you're putting in, you know, like five grams of this coral food. But like, where does it go? What happens after I put it in the tank? I don't, I can't see it. No. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And yeah. I mean, one thing, like, I'd say most modern aquariums, especially just... Um, they're you know, they're over filtered. That's yeah, sure. over filtered. Like I don't run filter rollers, but um, you know I have pretty pretty well sized protein skimmers for my systems. And um, one thing somebody kind of turned me on to a few years ago uh, that I did try a few times, and it didn't seem to do anything bad to the tank um, was uh, just put a few little um, drops of skim it from your protein skimmer back in the tank and let it cycle through. Um, with, yeah. to just give it a little nutrient spike. However, I don't know if there might be some like super, um, I don't know, unfavorable bacteria in Skimit um, that you don't Actually, want back in the tank. Um, yeah, I I tried doing something similar. So I had bought a bunch of pods for my system, and I, I had started up a new tank, and I wanted a pair of mandarins. So I bought some pods, and I didn't have a phytoculture going on. So I was like, hmm, pods eat detritus and poop, right? So maybe I'll put a little skimmate in there. Mm -hmm. And I put a drop, and like I took a syringe, I put one drop in there, and all the pods died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Oops. I definitely don't think that's a good idea long yeah. term. Because, I mean, you're putting in the end waste product back in your tank. That's like taking the poop out of your toilet and putting it in your house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you definitely don't want that. Something I was going to say about it, though, that's interesting is that you realize, like, um, I mean, we've all probably had a skimmer cup overflow into the sump before, um, yeah. you know. Um, it's pretty amazing how fast protein skimmers can actually pull that back out again. Like, I've had it happen. And once you get the bubbles kind of the, the level right, like, you can skim what you had in that cup back out in a day with most well-sized skimmers. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can, yeah, if you have an overflow, I mean... You kind of have to adjust it again, but you can get that all right again, yeah. super fast. Yeah. So but I mean, we, yeah. So our tanks are like super skimmed. There's like pretty much like nothing floating around in the water column, and we have to like kind of reintroduce that somehow, yeah. or just like limit our filtration to an extent. Yeah. And something um, I do is I run my protein skimmer. Actually, it's based on my pH. So when my pH hits uh, the kind of peak period of the day um when i hit it's about 8.5 um, my skimmer is off until it goes back down again so there's a rule in my yeah. impacts it basically turns my skimmer off for like i don't know right now it's like four to six hours a day my skimmer's off and that correlates with the peak probably feeding consumption time of the day too um like what do you yeah. think about that do you think there's any like negative to having that, that circulation off like my ph is already elevated so 
No, I, I mean, I definitely think that's a good approach to do things. Uh, my way of handling that is, um, so I don't want to pull outside air and pump it directly into my system just because I barbecue a lot and I don't mm-hmm. want any of those fumes to go into my tank. Yeah. So what funny. I do is a lot of these skimmers now are very strong. The pumps churn an incredible amount of air. And especially if you get like a really high end skimmer, like a bubble King, which I run, mm-hmm. you can adjust the skimmer pump. So what I do is I make a very turbulent reaction chamber and I just pump in as much air into the skimmer body as I can. And I don't really care too much about the skimming, mm-hmm. right? I just want the, the, you kind want of like the, the pH boost. In. Yeah. And I want like, you know, some of the large product particles and some of the crud to get out. But primarily I want it, that stuff to be digested and consumed by my corals. Yeah. I will also, I will also say that, you know, even though I'm dosing this insane concoction of food, I don't get that much skim made. Yeah. Interesting. And your yeah. nutrients are high and you don't really have algae issues. Like, you, no. yeah, yeah, it's a, I think it's a good example of, of, you know, what can it's, work. It, yeah. It's like a dream scenario. Pretty much, you know, you you can put in as much food and you pretty much don't have to care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, you get, and your, sold your on corals it. are living, they're <laughs> growing, they're thriving. I mean, that's like the best case scenario, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, yeah. so a little bit of a left turn here. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your lighting and kind of some of your preferences with that. Um, and as far as maybe you can give me a run through of, uh, say, spectrum and peak period um, and the types of lighting you're using. Yeah, so uh, right now I'm currently, I'm using Radeons um, on most of my tanks. I still have one tank lit exclusively by T5s and Reef Brights. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides that, it's either Radeons and T5s or just Radeons. Yeah. Yeah. So combo. Yeah. yeah that's similar yeah. to me. Yeah. I mean, ideally, if I could, I'd run metal halides on all my tanks. But uh, just the heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I miss them. And I, I really like the H, HQI version with those Phoenix bulbs. Yeah. Those were, those I were was, wicked. Uh, I used to run three 400 watt metal halide reef bright metal halides with the reef bright strips mm-hmm. over a 220 and i it was amazing the coral growth and the color you can't you can't replicate that with mm-hmm. leds there's mm-hmm. something in the light source that yeah i'm pretty sure that we you know maybe we're looking in the wrong area maybe we're not we're comparing spectrum or whatever but i think it's just the delivery of the light yeah my my way of really looking at is it important. is uh it's like a an analog spectrum versus a digital spectrum and the analog spectrum is 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 very wide and warm and kind of gives you that full range it's like listening to you know a record versus an mp3 or yeah. something you know and uh and a lot of things that i think people kind of run into issues with is they get these LED lights and they choose to only run blue, which is, I think, a very bad choice. Because the corals need to beautiful. Uh, they can utilize the entire visible light spectrum to some extent, right? Yeah. And you're, you're basically limiting the amount of energy that these corals are getting by your uh, uh, how you configure your lights. Yeah. What I, so what I do is, I, I mean, I pretty much run my radions in all channels at 100%. Mm -hmm. and I will, you know, adjust the intensity from there. Um, And when I view the tank, I'll turn on the blues. But beyond that, my tank runs full spectrum. Yeah. Okay. All the time. What's your peak period? How long would you say your your full sort of daylight period is? I run a very long photo period. Yeah. Like 15 hours. Yeah. Wow. That is very yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it's it's a 15 hour photo period. I never have like issues. I, I rarely have issues with coral bleaching. Yeah. Um, I can kind of maybe if it's like something new and it's not used to it, I get it. But like long term, these my acros look amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just like the, the they're constantly producing energy. Right. And they can create these extra stores of energy. Um, there possibly could be, a, you know, a photo inhibition. Yeah, into, that's what uh, I was going to ask you about. Um, and it would be actually be a good thing for me too, because I'm going to do fact check episodes here and there. But is there a maximum amount of photosynthesis that the zooxanthellae can, um, right. can do in, in, yeah. in one photo period? You know? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it, my idea is that the zooxanthellae can't really handle intensity. 
but they can handle the duration. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. If you, if you like, you know, blast it with a laser beam for a few seconds, no matter what, you'll probably burn the crap out of it. Mm-hmm. But if you kind of keep this like simmering, like low, moderate light over it continually, it will have the ability to like, you know, uh, go through its processes without being overloaded. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they're, they're building up carbon dioxide over the course of the day. And there's, there has to be a yeah. maximum capacity where it hits a threshold and then it's, it's got to come out. So yeah, I mean, yeah. that's where flow comes in. You have to mm-hmm. really have strong flow in these high light, high nutrient environments. Mm-hmm. So that's how they, the corals like release and get rid of all their, you know, byproducts and waste. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you think with higher, higher nutrients, higher flow is probably has to be yeah. um, hand in hand with um, yeah. essentially flushing it out. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's like you're eating a lot. You got to go to the bathroom a lot and you got to flush the toilet a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. Same thing in your tank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> flush them. You're flushing the toilet constantly. Um, yeah. But so, but I'm still curious, like you say you have this 15 hour or 14, 15 hour period, but there must be like, for me, I have about a five or a six hour peak where it's like, um, that's probably my highest par where some things are going to get 400 to 450 um, yeah. micromoles in the kind of top th- regions. But but then for a lot of the mm-hmm. rest of the day, it's going to be kind of ramped down to, you know, 200, yeah. 250. Um, yeah, my photo period, I think kind of looks like a trapezoid. If anyone can kind of figure that out, like kind of imagine that in their head, yeah. it'll go up. And then there's like, a, I think a four hour peak. Mm-hmm. And then it's just a steady ramp down. Yeah, yeah. But okay. it's over the duration of like 15 hours. So it's a a long photo period. And I think like for f- those four hours at peak, my, my actors probably receive anywhere from like uh, 400 to like maybe 550 par. Yeah. But then the rest of the time it's going up or it's going down from there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. No, that's um, pretty... I think about what I would expect, but, um, it sounds like you're able to kind of view the tank uh, all day. Like as long as you're awake, it's basically awake. <laughs> oh yeah. Level. I mean, yeah. I mean, even, even when the tank's supposed to go to sleep, I mean, I'm still up, so I turn the lights on. So, yeah, uh, yeah. for, for some, some of these days, I mean, I think the lights are on maybe, maybe close to like 18 hours if I'm doing like heavy maintenance at night. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm a night owl. So I'm, looking at the tank at like 1am 2pm or whatever and you yeah. can kind of see it in my reef to reef post so like a lot of the times i'm posting at night <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair yeah. um yeah and that's um i mean i think checking on your tank at night is is a good indication like you're gonna if the better the polyp extension at night is is sort of a really good indication of the health of the corals and people talk about polyp yeah. extension but i'm kind of trying to sell the term um, polyp health should be kind of yeah. talked about more than polyp extension because if the polyp health is good, the polyp the polyp is going to be larger and expand more and just have it's basically a larger animal. Like each polyp right, is an yeah. animal. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Each polyp is the organism. The yeah. com- com- the entirety of all those polyps is the colony. So yeah, it's definitely polyp health over polyp extension. I think that's a better uh, term for that. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, like. If a coral polyp extends, what exactly does that mean? You know, we well, we don't quite understand it yet. I mean, maybe it's searching for food or maybe it's healthy. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Right. And even like, like, especially with these speciosis, what drives me crazy is that they'll look amazing. Their polyps are maybe like, an, maybe like half an inch away from the coral light. Mm-hmm. The polyp extension is amazing, but I can't keep them. Some of them, I can't keep them long term. And the thing is, they'll just randomly die in a section and the colony will stop dying or like maybe like a branch will just die right mm-hmm. in the middle which is very weird usually uh you get an acro that rtns it's gone overnight but not with these speciosis so even though they have great polyp extension maybe their polyp health might not be the best yeah it might not be the indication that we're sort of looking for um because maybe the coral is not getting something that it needs and it's like that's why the polyp is extended so much yeah exactly but i mean usually usually in our experience or in my experience you know if your your acro has really good polyp extension it typically is pretty healthy yeah but Maybe it's something, yeah, maybe it's like a microbial thing that these corals haven't adjusted to yet. 
mm-hmm. and it's exploiting them because they don't have the immune system for it. Yeah. Well, and that's why I asked you with the Spiciosa, like how long you've had some of the strains, because, you know, um, we haven't seen a lot of it in Canada yet, but um, yeah. I can tell you that, like, I would be way more on top of buying a piece um, that I knew somebody had conditioned for two years versus two months yeah. or two weeks. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, especially with the speciosis. Like, I mean, I'll, mm-hmm. uh, I have a few that I, I will not touch them because I do not want anything to happen to them. Mm-hmm. They're so hard to get your hands on to begin with, and they're so finicky. Um, I think one of my pieces, I call it the CRT Nitro. I've had that since like one of like the first few speciosa imports in the U.S., and I've had that for a while now. It's been pretty hardy, but I'll still get like, you know, random die off. So I just have multiple backups of it yeah. just sitting around in my Different systems. systems. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh, I mean, a lot of these corals, they have to take multiple generations of fragging and getting used to your system. And even then, there's still chances that it will randomly melt. Like mm-hmm. I have some like acro strains that have been in the hobby probably like 10 years at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Like, um, like my CRT Delight, I've had that since like the early 2010s. Mm-hmm. And that thing is like indestructible. It, it, I mean, it, w- it went through the period in time where I didn't understand what um, alkalinity or calcium was or w- the importance of that. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> these corals have to adjust through so many different fluctuations. And I think where um, aquaculture really comes in is that they're exposed to these fluctuations. And it go- kind of goes back to our uh, topic about consistency in an aquaculture environment, you know, these captive systems – they can be seemingly consistent. They're not consistent 100% all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'll have like an issue, something, maybe your calcium reactor breaks down, your skimmer pump broke, uh, uh, my ATO overfilled my tank or yeah. whatever. Some kind of swing. Yeah. 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 And those, ex- um, those experiences make the coral stronger. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. 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 And like, yeah, like so think about cor- corals, like uh, some of the or- early ORA corals, like, those are some of the hardier corals that I have. And, and, uh, yeah, actually funny though, on that, um, note, um, a red plant, ORA red planet, I used to grow, you know, just like sheets of it. <laughs> now it doesn't oh, yeah. do as well I, for me. I remember that piece. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it doesn't do as a well massive for me colony. Now. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I used to keep things a lot more simple. That was, it was back in the days of pre ICP and, um, you mm-hmm. know, looking back I mean, on it, I wasn't feeding heavy back then. My system was running lean. Um, yeah. So, you and, know, hard to say. Mm-hmm. A lot of these things, like, if you're going to choose to change your method, you kind of have to approach it in a holistic sense. If you're going to feed heavier, you're going to have to increase your nutrient export. Or if you're going to, like, dose these trace elements, you're going to have to make sure that there's no trace element buildup, right? Yeah. And you ha- kind of have to like understand these like fundamentals in your aquarium and how these processes work and not just kind of go off whatever the manufacturer says. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a danger. A lot too. of it is just yeah. recommended dose on a lot of these products is it's wildly high. It's not often, oh, yeah. you know, anywhere I mean, <laughs> close to where it should be. For like a reefer with like, you know, a pretty sparse tank with like a few acros in there and whatever. I mean, yeah, you don't really have to follow what they say. Yeah, yeah. I like your, your tank doesn't need it. I think um, some products say light stock system dose this much per day, medium, heavy. Like, you know, yeah. that's, it uh, gives you a re- better idea, but still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a very subjective topic because what is lightly stocked? Yeah. Because maybe yeah. I could I could look at my tank and be like, man, that's kind of lightly stocked. But anyone that comes over, it's like, man, this is jam-packed with acros. Like, yeah. nah, I could fit a few more. In yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Get a little defensive. I do, too. <laughs> I can fit more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as far as, like, pH, um, I didn't ask you when we were talking about skimmers, but um, are you doing CO2 scrubber or anything like that? Um, no. So I my house is, um, there aren't too many inhabitants in here. It's just my family and my dog. Yeah. And so there's not a lot of CO2 being uh you know, in the air. And I also have a air exchange in my fish room okay. along with like a, an air filter, a HEPA filter, AC unit. So there's a lot of air circulation going around and my pH in my systems always stays around eight maybe gets up to like 8.6. Yeah. Okay. So, but it, it, is that uh, like a swing in a day or you're going to say that's kind of the average between all the tanks? 
Uh, it's like average over all the tanks, I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, depending on if I'm using calc or not, I'll give an extra increase into it or if I open the door or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that kind of gets me to another thing we didn't discuss yet is uh, what do you prefer for supplying your major elements? Like, are you using reactors, two part? Yeah. So I use a calcium reactor. Um, yeah. That supplies most of my major elements. And I am a big proponent of water changes mm -hmm. uh, just to remove, like, the, you know, the potential, like, toxic buildup of nutrients in the tank. Because that's your your easiest way. You can rely on the bacteria all you want, but let's say you your bacteria population crashes without you noticing because you can't see them, mm -hmm. and your tank turns into this like toxic cesspool, you know, and mm -hmm. you can't get rid of it without doing water changes. So I'm a big proponent of that. So yeah. I do um, maybe like a, what my tanks are 120 or about 120 gallons. I do a 10 gallon water change every week mm -hmm. on all of them. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, so, so constant not, not water huge. changes is pretty important. Yeah. Do you, um, I mean, obviously bacteria is being added with this feeding regimen you've developed, but um, do you add bacteria with your water changes ever? Um, I don't really have to. I think, you know, just due to the frequency of what, of which I feed, yeah. uh, there's always like there, I'm always supplementing or increasing the population somehow mm -hmm. or reintroducing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've wondered if um, doing water change, I've started doing them weekly and I never have been a weekly water changer. Um, just kind of an experiment. Um, I also switched salt recently and I wanted to kind of ease my way into it. So I'm doing 10% yeah. like a week instead of, I would say I was doing 20% every three or four weeks before. So I'm doing 10% a yeah. week. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of yeah. wondering if I'm kind of like maybe sterilizing the system a little bit. Um, you know, by not adding new bacteria um, as I'm taking it out. But I, f I feel like bacteria is quite good at proliferating in our systems. Yeah. If it's in your tank already, it's probably going to stay in your tank, right? Yeah. Unless you run an antibiotic through it, then who knows what happens, who, who yeah. survives and how the succession works afterwards. Who knows? But if you put in everything and you don't put in a product to kill all your bacteria, you can have some probability or that it's in there maybe it got out competed and the population went to zero but you can't really know without doing uh analysis right yeah no it's and it's never going to be zero anyways so because yeah. those you know i mean yeah. actually i mean it, it can go to near zero yeah that's definitely true. i guess if it's and, a broad I mean, enough antibiotic or something that's wiping out like yeah yeah quite a and few it's of the not, strains yeah. and it's not like once you get to like near zero levels you're adding a point where there is so much uh, competition for these organisms to regain control, right? So like after you put an uh, antibiotic in your tank, your tank is a barren wasteland, right? It's like mm -hmm. a desert. Mm -hmm. But there's still all this stuff that has the ability to like grow back and you don't know what the population will be afterwards. So maybe you ran Cipro in your tank, right? And you killed all the nasty stuff, but killed, killed a lot of the some good of stuff. the good stuff as well. Yeah. And maybe that one particular nasty that you were tackling at first died off, but there could have been another one just waiting for an opportunity. Yeah. Like, oh, it's easy for me to grow now. So I'm going to explode and I'm going to still have more issues. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of what uh, these people are seeing in their tanks. Like they'll run Cipro and a few months later, they'll have an issue again. It's mm -hmm. probably, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the start of a vicious cycle um, that, yeah. you know, if anyone can avoid, I think they should. Um, but yeah. yeah. If you were to 100%. say, if somebody was to run an antibiotic in their system, um, Cipro, oxalic acid, one of those kind of things, chemically even, and you were to wipe yeah. out, um, like, what would what do you think would be a good bacteria product to use? Um, I've used Rebiotic before, and I feel like it is a good um, product for your surfaces, especially. And that's in your um, concoction too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there, are, there yeah. are three different products. Um, I'll, I think I, I had some Dr. Tim stuff when I first started out, but then I ran out and I didn't buy any more. But I mean... If you can, um, having multiple different things on hand, probably good. You mm -hmm. know, it just increases the competition and it uh, probably lessens the likelihood of these like pathogenic bacteria getting hold. 
just due to like the competition from all the good guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So probably a variety. Um, yeah, I had yeah. some good success with the Tropic Marin uh, Nitrobiotic before. Um, it actually killed dinos in a system for me um, after I tried oh, wow. a whole bunch of different things. Um, so, yeah, and it's not like, I mean, we don't have Tropic Marin at like the local shops here that much. It's not super accessible. So I wouldn't have thought to try it. But I was like, you know, just try a different bottle of something else. And, and you know, within about two weeks, it was the dinos were gone in that system. And there's nothing else I changed. So... You know, you, you never know what is going to be the piece of the puzzle that's going to kind of, you know, make up for that, whatever that issue is, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's, a, it's a hard thing, man. This hobby is very challenging. I mean, it, it can, you can make it simple or as difficult as you want it to be. But at the core level, you have to account for so many things. And that, I mean, that's what makes the hobby so beautiful and so fun, yeah. right? It doesn't, it doesn't get easier. Like it doesn't seem like it gets easier. It, I mean, it, no. it can be as easy as you want it to be, I guess I should say yeah, it that way. Can, yeah. But, but like if you're questing for, you know, this better and this better and this better, like the quest will never end. We're always trying to yeah. get things better. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, you can bring this back to your personal experience like going on like a health journey and making yourself more fit or whatever. You constantly have to dedicate your time to it. You constantly have to learn new things and you're changing your techniques as your time goes on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes things are you, constantly you know, evolving. Sometimes you have to get a little bit worse before you get better too. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, like the depressing that's, part of it. That's definitely very yeah. true. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of things we, we can't control for even with our best intent and time spent into it it's it's hard to account for all the variables uh for things that can go wrong yeah, yeah. but i mean it, that's i mean that's our job as uh reefers right we gotta we gotta stay in it tough it out and then try and figure out what we did wrong and how not to repeat it yeah no and i, I really like um the the things you're doing because you're very you're sharing what you're learning and experimenting with and putting it out there and i'll definitely link to your threads and stuff like that so um, yeah you i know. mean my my biggest pet peeve are the super secretive folk that think that they know everything and yeah. that they what, like, are like KZ? on top of the world. <laughs> oh man, if if they told me what was in those bottles, I mean, yeah. that'd be great. But I mean, they probably would lose a lot of, you know, yeah. sales. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing. We we all benefit from sharing our experiences and anecdotes and. And uh, especially when we have like slightly harder data where it's like we only change one thing and we can kind of like zero in on something. Um, but there's yeah. a lot of misinformation out there, too. Um, you know, I just an example, I had a, um, a customer who had posted some photos of their tank and they were like, oh, I've been dosing uh, Acro Power for the last month and my, my corals look better than ever. And then I was like, didn't you do an interceptor treatment about a month ago? And they were like, oh, yeah. I'm like, that's why your corals look way better. So now all these people yeah. see that post and they're going and buying uh, buying it's, Acro Power. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's, uh... it's hard to <laughs> it's, it's hard to keep track of what we're doing. Because, like, I mean, you see an issue and you, you're frantic and you're like, oh, I got to fix this before my whole tank goes to shit. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for swearing. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. yeah, I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's hard, you know, and in I mean, panic mode. We're yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, we're not. We're not in a laboratory setting. So. Mm -hmm. We just have to do whatever's in our power to get it right before things go really south. Yeah. I need some like uh, game show theme. Ja -ba -da -da -ba -ba -da. <laughs> Rapid fire questions. <laughs> yeah. Put that in post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put in the Jeopardy show. And now for my favorite part of the show, rapid fire questions. All right. So <laughs> first question, uh, favorite fish. So hard, man. I'm a, I'm a fish guy at heart. And recently I was, I've been able to get some of my favorite fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll give you like my favorite fish in each category. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Doesn't have to be yeah, rapid. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, my favorite tang is definitely got to be an Achilles. Um, yeah, they're beautiful. Uh, they're so, so gorgeous. They're, they're majestic in their own way. Uh, I was able to get one uh, six, seven years ago. He was super emaciated when he came in. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, they always look horrendous when they come in. They're not particularly easy, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I've heard so. I got this, yeah. yeah, I got this guy to eat and I nursed him back from pretty much being paper thin. And now I've had him for about seven years now. Right. And he's like the king of my tank. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a black tang in there or a black tang hybrid. And, you know, 
they're that's also another amazing fish um people will say they don't like them but i think there's something pretty beautiful about just being you know that jet black of theirs it's just like yeah you're and looking. Then, you're looking into the abyss. Yeah, know? it's an interesting uh, ev- evolution when a lot of reef fish are very colorful and vibrant to just be black. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, my black tank's probably. I don't know. It's probably the size of my face when it, oh, the fins are out, mm-hmm. and it's. Fun. I was about to swear, but uh, it's amazing. Awesome. It's cool. a. It's a beautiful fish. Uh, okay. Uh, favorite SPS. You can say a species. You can. You can generalize too. Uh, my favorite uh, SPS, I'd say, this is hard. Well, it's a little biased because, I mean, it's one of my pieces, but it's um, the Rainbow Explosion, or some people might know it as a Hung's Rainbow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, it's like a Rainbow Granulosa, Hmm. which is probably, I've never, I've been, I mean, I've been trying to find another one from these throughout these years it's been probably like 10 12 years since i've you know i've had it in my own care but i've never seen another one come in cool is it from um, indonesia originally i have no clue i yeah. just got it at a store one day it was like a brown nub in like mm-hmm. the early 2010s mm-hmm. and i just kept it alive mm-hmm. and it was just amazing it started off kind of green i'm like oh, okay let's see what happens and then it started developing red and then blue and then the axial correlates are like bright yellow. Yeah. And that's just crazy. Um, yeah, that luckily, awesome. um, luckily, I was uh, able to send a frag out to Adam at Battle Coral. Mm-hmm. And he and he was the guy pretty much who kind of shared it around the hobby. Because shortly after, I got a few frags out. And then I had a horrible tank crash when I was mm-hmm. going out on vacation. Mm-hmm. And that pretty much wiped out my entire... The entirety of my SPS collection. Yeah, got to have backups, so, and Adam yeah. would be a great person to have. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. So yeah. I, I thank Adam for keeping that thing in the hobby. Mm-hmm. Sweet. <laughs> it's a super slow grower, but it's definitely one of the most unique acros that's out there. Yeah, awesome. That's cool. Uh, okay, uh, favorite LPS. Ooh, art. I like the. I guess they're all kind of similar. Uh, Scobies, Trackies, Welsos, and yeah. probably uh, Acanthos. Yeah. Those are really the kind what of I... Meat, meaty corals. Yeah, those yeah. super meaty like LPS. I love those. And the amount of like variation between all of them, it, yeah. it's crazy. The, the patterns can be so different on each one. I mean, torch corals are, seem to be the rage at the moment. Yeah. But their their variation is much more subtle yeah than, they're no, you don't see so many one of a kinds whereas you know yeah a, a scoli or a or a acantho is they're completely one of a kind some of those variations yeah right? i have a oh i've had one it was a refraff asia brain coral that i got from two guys coral mm-hmm. way 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 back when they were importing from refraff asia and i think that's mm-hmm. probably one of the nicest like trackies or welsos uh that i've ever gotten yeah, there's cool. so many colors packed in mm-hmm. to like such a tiny area uh i think i sent some photos so maybe yeah. you'll pop yeah, up there'll on be the lots screen. of photos going through yeah totally i'll try to yeah. time it so that one comes oh. up now uh okay yeah, but this is oh, this is yeah. it so. sweet sweet okay yeah, i'll find that one uh so i don't know if you keep much for softies but what would you say favorite softies Uh, jawbreaker mushroom, discosomas, actually really funny. A long time ago, I was super duper into jawbreakers and eclectus mushrooms. And I took a full tank shot, my mushroom tank and Ecotech took a picture and re- they reposted it on their Facebook, but they spelled my name wrong. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of held that against them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if you go on their, if you go on their Facebook page, you can probably find a picture of my system mm-hmm. in there. There's probably... Geez, there's probably a hundred something different type of mushrooms wow. in there. Or like cool. different colored jawbreakers, candy crushes, dead pools, those yeah. those type of mushrooms. Those were definitely one of my favorites. They're just they're finicky. Actually, yeah. I think that um they do much better in an SPS system. Yeah. Than yeah. Uh, just keeping them on their own. I think that's just because uh, you know, if you keep like a tank on their own and you think that these LPS or softies need dirty water that thinking that dirty means like less maintenance is mm-hmm. pretty incongruent, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, all all of my mushrooms that are the kind of Rhodoctus um, sort of bounce type ones, they're all in my SPS system, kind of semi under the racks, so they get a little bit oh, yeah. of light, and they freaking love it there. So yeah, I mean, know. I I moved the jawbreaker when I was having issues from the mushroom tank into my SPS tank, and it grew like crazy. I'm like, man, mm-hmm. this is complete BS. What these people are telling me to keep my water dirty, mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. not true. It's not true. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it's um, if the trace element profiles a little more in line in that system versus maybe you pay less attention to it in the mushroom system or yeah i definitely yeah. Uh, yeah i didn't have a calcium reactor in that tank i mean they're not uh those things don't calcify yeah so yeah. i didn't i didn't think it was very important but i mean yeah. definitely those trace elements are from the calcium reactor media was what was really playing an important role in their health yeah yeah it could be a big part of it Cool. Okay. Uh, I think I already know the answer to this, but favorite light can be source or product. Favorite light. I mean, time tested and true. It's got to be metal halides. Yeah. With the the way technologies are going right now, it's LEDs the the future. Yeah. So that's true. You can hop on the trade now, or you can just be an old geezer in a few years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's why I call my, um, aquatic life T5 fixtures. I call them my training wheels for led because yeah, (laughs) transition point. (laughs) It's, uh, it's just the way that you deliver the light to the coral. That's what's important. I think at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, all these lights can produce similar spectrum, but their form of delivery is much different. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, with like a T5, it's like an even blanket, very, yeah. you know, not super intense point source like an LED. Mm-hmm. But, and same with the halides, it's an intense point source, but the reflector, you know, balances everything out yeah. and delivers like a nice even light throughout the coral. Whereas LEDs, even with like these new radions with their uh, new optics and stuff, they're still very focus yeah in, it's true. intense you see and whatever shading, the, shading in the branches yeah. of say acapora oh, yeah. colonies and such 100 yeah. percent. shading yeah. with leds is super noticeable compared to let's say like halides or t5s and yeah i won't say the brand but it's one of these newer led lights that claim to be a radion competitor and i tried it and man it was horrendous because it mm-hmm. didn't have to spread mm-hmm. right it had it claimed to have better spectrum it claimed to have uh better intensity or whatever but the light was tiny Mm -hmm. and you can't you can't um the form factor was just wrong yeah like what are you going to do raise it up an extra two feet then the you know then you're losing par at that point you might get more yeah exactly yeah but the the main issue with lights is shadowing um shadow shadows will kill your sps colonies yeah i agree like one side of the branch will have polyps and the other side will just melt and the entire thing will melt Mm -hmm. half the colony didn't get any nutrients yeah yeah no it's true it's like yeah those polyps are not healthy so you can't have half a coral not healthy (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah uh what would you say is your favorite product line if you were kind of just to uh, zero in on one product line for various uses well my philosophy is to mix and match no one product line will cover all your bases right some things might be better from one company and other companies might have a better alternative, but I don't think you could say I'm going to stick with company X and go with them all the way down. Cause yeah. I mean, well, it's interesting you're, that you're, you say that because um, it seems like more people in Europe use one system. Like they'll use all Tropic Marin, all Aquaforest, all Fauna Marin. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those, those systems are uh, set up so that they meet all the requirements of the coral and I think all those uh, companies offer a similar product offering in general. But mm-hmm. it's like I said, there are small nuances. Maybe the concentration is different or the sourcing of their ingredients is slightly different. Mm-hmm. And their directions can be different as well. So who knows? Like Aqu- Aquaforest and KZ are very similar in their product line and their philosophies. But the, you'll get a different result if you choose to run all Aquaforest or all KZ. And mm-hmm. so w- w- where my philosophy comes in is I'll, you know, I'll, I'm willing to try a lot of things and kind of experiment and kind of see what I can use, and what is good for me in the long run. Cause I could, I could say I stick with one thing and it looks amazing for me, but I never had an experience with another product. So mm-hmm. I, it's not mm-hmm. the truth, you know? Yeah. And how could one product make 
the best amino, the best trace element composition, the yeah, best exactly. salt. Like it, it's probably unlikely that they will be the best at all the things. So yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying for sure. Um, I mean, it sounds nice to just use one product line and follow their protocol and, and oh yeah, not it's do easy. Anything else? Yeah, <laughs> it I sounds mean, great. It's like you tell you tell me to follow your book, I follow your book, and my tank looks good. That, that's great. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, what what we really want or what I really want as a hobbyist is to have the best possible, you know, environment or uh, system out there. So, yeah, you know, you can get to like maybe 85, 90% if you follow one uh, product line or whatever, but I'm looking to get up to that, like 98%, 99% mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, the quest, the constant quest mm -hmm. as we talked about. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you can, you can definitely go down a rabbit hole that might lead you to some, bad conclusions or you could very easily screw up your tank that's why i don't recommend a lot of these people to go out and like copy what i do mm -hmm. i have everything out there so that you can kind of think about it and like yeah. come to your own conclusions but i i would never tell anyone do this yeah you know because your tank is not my tank yeah no that's i think that's the best way to to uh, present your perspectives um anyways like you know don't don't say it like I don't know. You're not telling anybody what to do. You're just saying these are some things that work for me, you know. Yeah, I, like I'll show everyone. Like, yeah. I'll have people come over and I'll I'll mix up the concoction and I'll pour it in front of them. And they'll, they can visibly see what's happening when I mm -hmm. dose all this stuff into my tank. And they can, you know, go on and conclude for themselves whether they needed to do it or not. I mean, I'm not going to tell you to spend like a few hundred dollars for some like liquids and powders. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's crazy. It's madness. Yeah. No, but if you sure. if you think that you're on that same quest and you're looking for the same results that I'm getting, sure, go ahead. This is what I'm doing. Follow me. Mm -hmm. I'm not like repping a brand or no one is like behind my back telling me to shove like any products down your throat. But that's definitely what, you know, the I think the right approach is to things yeah. like yeah, visiting sure. other reefers, seeing where their success comes from and trying to emulate them to the best of your ability or to your use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, okay, favorite aquarium controller if you have experience with multiple. This might sound this might sound crazy, but all my tanks are pretty much run by hand. Okay, so your favorite aquarium I, controller is yourself. <laughs> yeah, I am my favorite aquarium controller. Uh, every time Ryan comes by my house, he's still like in shock that we have all these systems and it's just me and my dad maintaining everything. Yeah, which I mean, there there can. They're, they can come up with issues, especially when we go on vacation. That's probably the scariest situation. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, there's typically usually someone at home to maintain everything. And yeah. honestly, I think I rather have that sense of like hands on duty. The aquarium controller kind of gives you like a false sense of safety. Yeah. Because especially like going a few years back, aquarium controllers did not have the ability to like monitor your alkalinity, your calcium, your magnesium. Yeah. None of those testers existed. And an aquarium controller was basically a very fancy timer. Yeah. Right? Yeah, with maybe temperature and, temperature probes too, but Yeah, temperature yeah. and pH, but like yeah. other than that, it it controlled a few outlets and what else did it do? Maybe turn your lights on and off? Mm -hmm. Turn your pumps on and off? And yeah, I don't have to do that. I have radions and I have MP40s. So yeah. There's no need for a controller there. Yeah. They all already have their own system and heaters i have yeah i have a chiller on all my tanks and a uh, temperature controller for that so i don't really need an apex and i run my skimmer 24 7 so i don't really need to turn it off any freaking yeah. then yeah and i still have to do a water change and i have so many different systems it would not make sense for me to buy like six different like auto water change uh setups no, for sure <laughs> so so yeah it comes down to like logistics and yeah. what makes the most sense for your uses yeah yeah, and I think, you know, being very in touch with your tank is where you find the most success. Because if you say, I want a reef tank and spend like an hour a week on it, you're not going to have a reef tank. You have a glass box with water. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I don't even believe like most people need a controller, especially something like a Trident. If you're new in the hobby, like, um, right. you know, it's really not a necessary tool until you start having like major amounts of growth in your cor coral population gets exponential yeah. like we talked about earlier. I think where a controller comes in handy is when you have a very large system with a very large volume mm -hmm. and you need to always have like some sort of monitoning on it. Yeah. Right. Like if you my have like trident a has caught small tank. 
My yeah, yeah, definitely. My trident has caught uh, alkalinity swings quite a few times for me, and it's been something like oh, like uh, dropped like 0.5 in the day where it usually doesn't drop less than 0.1 or something, and then I'll go look and yeah. it's like. Um, you know, my calcium reactor feed line is a little bit blocked and it's coming out as a dotted yeah. line instead of a solid line, like things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably saved me a few pretty major swings. And if I was away while that happened, could be bad Oh yeah, news. 100%. Controllers come in handy when you travel a lot or your system volume is just so large that you need monitoring. Mm -hmm. But other than that, if you can still do it manually i think that's the best approach because it makes you in tune with your system mm -hmm. you look at your tank uh you know what's going wrong and you know the the frequent failure points like you said like it could be your calcium reactor it's like yeah for me it's my calcium reactor because sometimes the line will be clogged as well mm -hmm. i gotta go in there and i gotta adjust the flow again so yeah i mean if you if if you know where your key problem areas are and you pay attention to that you're not you're most likely going to have fewer issues if you do it manually Whereas if you have a controller say, oh, something's going wrong, but you've never done any manual intervention to begin with, mm -hmm. you're going in with like a fresh slate and you're not knowing where to fix the problem to begin with. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah, I see the reefer that has a schedule that cleans their, you know, return pump impellers or uh, cleans their dosing lines on a regular basis. Like they're going to they're going to get to that problem before it's even going to hit your your your. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Your number one, your number one way to avoid any major hiccup is to be very proactive I mean, in anything you do in your life. You got to be proactive. You yeah. can never be reactive. So if you're reactive, you have to catch up. And then once you catch up, you never even know if you're going to get beyond the catch up point. You could still be battling something throughout and that period just prolongs all the stress mm -hmm. and all the chaos that could be going on in your tank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely up and down, up and down shocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite wave pump? Um, I run MP forties on all my systems. Yeah. Uh, just because of how the layout works. Like, uh, and I also have a lot of rasses. So the gyros don't really work too well. Cause I need them like a net or like a mesh top on my mm -hmm. top and my tanks. And if I have a cord sticking out, there's like a little gap in there. And you know how rat, like those fish can be men. If there's a gap, they're getting mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And I do not want like my super like expensive fish to be on the floor. Right? Yeah. I'm just like crying. <laughs> yeah. MP40s are, are wicked for sure. Even though I have some old oh, yeah. versions that are still running just fine from, I'd say, yeah, I, 12 years ago or something. from like 2014. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, they're still rocking. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's a good testament I mean, to them. The, the one thing with the MP40s, I will say... Um, a few years back, they had a wet side issue where their magnets would corrode like crazy. I think I had a, a box full and I brought it to the rep at one of the shows in Chicago at the time. Might have been like Aquashella or something. Mm -hmm. And I showed them all their faulty products. And <laughs> they were just shocked. Mm -hmm. They would they couldn't they, they could not imagine. I, I brought them like 12 wet sides with rusty magnets. Really? And I was like, yeah, it was like, it's crazy. My tank is, you know, I'm spending four or $500 on a pump expecting like, you know, the best cream of the crop out there. But if I'm, I'm having issues like this, what's the point, right? I just buy J-Bow and throw it out once mm -hmm. it dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but did you get down to the bottom of what might have been causing it? Because I've heard that um, vinegar is pretty hard on those magnets and you should be using citric acid. Yeah. So instead. I, I have been using citric acid since then. Mm -hmm. Um, even before I didn't really use vinegar. I, I just use a toothbrush, mm -hmm. you know, just to get off like any algae and I put it back in the tank. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, MP40s are very easy to do maintenance on. So I just pluck one out and put a yeah. new one in. That's true. It doesn't right, take too right long. Away. Then you don't have to worry about soaking yeah. it and whatever, just clean the crap out but of yeah, it on the spot. I, uh, I rarely had issues with like the older MP40s. Um, I yeah. definitely think, you know, once... They released in the quiet drives. They switched up the materials or something. Yeah. And there was some quality control issues. But I think they've kind of like ironed it out at this point. Oh, well, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I haven't had any, uh, you know, busted magnets in a yeah. long time. My newer wet so sides. That's a good thing. My newer wet sides I haven't had any issues with. So I think uh, yeah. maybe they figured out what it was. But uh, yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, what is your most despised pest? Oh, pest. Let me think about it. I mean, 
there are a lot of solutions to a lot of pests, but I think my most despised ones are gotta be like those like parasitic copods because they don't get off in dips. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah, you're talking um, like acrobugs and yeah, bot, so you, yeah, there's you gotta a have, version too. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't even know they existed for a good bit. I thought I, I knew about red bugs, but like these newer ones coming in from, I mean, ever since like uh, these Indo had opened up, Mm-hmm. whatever collection spots they're taking the corals from they're like infested with these like yeah. bugs or whatever and a lot of people don't know about them mm-hmm. they've never experienced about them everyone knows about flatworms and red bugs and whatever like there's actually um acro boring snails i'm mm-hmm. not sure if you ever experienced those i've seen so parasitic like in- snails on acros but not i don't know if, about boring ones that bore or uh, yeah i don't know about <laughs> But it, they they go into the skeleton. Yeah, they like embed themselves wow. into the skeleton. And uh, man, I had this amazing endophilia. It was like the color of a Costco like yellow microfiber cloth. Mm-hmm. It was that. Yeah. I don't know if you have yeah. seen one. No, of I know those. what you're talking it's about. Like, yeah, it was that yellow. And I went away to school, and I came back, and it looked horrendous. And I'm like, what happened? And I looked at it. The mouth was gaping, right? And I saw a little proboscis sticking out of mm-hmm. the mouth. I'm like, no way. What is this? So I dipped it. Um, I thought the dip had killed it, but I guess not. And after a few weeks, I tried and go in there with like some dental tools and like pry it out. But it was just too like embedded within the skeleton. Mm-hmm. I, I just didn't want to do anything to it. And uh, it ultimately led to the demise. And then Damn. once, you know, the, the endophilia passed away, I took the skeleton out. I like dissected the skeleton and man, I, I put that snail through the worst thing it could experience <laughs> in mankind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it had a bad day. Yeah. Well, yeah, so another that's... thing to be concerned about. So these, is this some kind of boring snail that can probably go in uh, damage yeah, uh, different types of coral, like different species? Yeah. I yeah. think they're more prominent in like these LPS because they're just one large polyp. Yeah. And yeah. they can really wreak havoc in those things because, I mean, uh, once the polyp gets weak, there's no, like, surrounding colony to help it out, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, it's kind of, you think about, like, acros and those colonized, multi-polyp colonized type corals where they're kind of all kind of helping each other out as a team a little bit. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. like an acro colony, you can have, like, a butterfly or an angel like, eat a polyp. It's not, no big deal. Yeah. Another one will replace it, but, like... Yeah. If you have an angel or like a butterfly pick at like your brain corals or whatever, it's gonna have a pretty hard time, yeah, yeah. especially if it's constantly being picked at. Yeah, the, because they one, tend to go for the feeding yeah. polyps too, right? So, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Actually, my uh, my blue tang in my system, he'll eat the mesentrial filaments from my acros. Mm-hmm. Once I put in the concoction, he goes around all my acros and he just nips, mm. nips, nips, nips. Mm. So they must be tasty for him. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess so. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Okay, so final question, uh, sort of thought experiment. Uh, if you had the financial means and the life situation to do so, would you set up a polo reef? Oh, man, that guy's, that guy's system is like a dream come true, man. That's <laughs> yeah. like, honestly, if I, if I had the means and I could put together that type of team, I, I would love to. I mean... Uh, my dream right now is if I could consolidate all my systems into one. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, I only had the 125 originally in a, a 90 gallon cube, but now I have like six or yeah, six independent systems that are you know, it can be a really hard to maintain six independent tanks. That's a lot of different and tanks. Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, for there are pros and cons. I can like isolate certain things or have like species specific um stuff like a long time ago i was a seahorse breeder actually when i was a little kid Mm -hmm. uh so i had my own little seahorse tank and i had some corals in there and whatnot and yeah it's good if you have a lot of systems you can really go species specific and cater to like one or two specific things that you really want to have thrive but ideally for me right now it's you know I'm, i'm a big acro guy so mm-hmm. if I could, I would just have like maybe like one massive tank, kind of like Ryan does. I mean, he's yeah. he's got me jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a frag tank display. I don't know, just it's just a bit of everything. He's got to got to got to get it all kind of sectioned off and and um, getting along yeah, in the same I mean, system. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, but there are all 
also comes with having like a one huge connected system as well. It's harder to yeah. maintain these elements and issues can, you know, once you have issues, there's not like a way to rescue it. Cause I can't just pick it up and put in a new system. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, there are a lot of different small things that you kind of have to consider. And like I said, it all has to boil down to your use case and what you want out of it. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Six systems. That sounds like, a lot of work to me, but uh, especially with yeah, manual but, testing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I get to like do different things. I get to stock uh, each tank very differently. I have one tank where it's RAS dominated. Um, and I have like a diamond tail flasher, uh, rhomboids, a pair of like mated blue star leopards, actually, that mm-hmm. it's surprising cool. to see that they're like trying to court each other and they're just yeah. swimming and doing their dance all the time. Um, like, John, like a bunch of different fairy asses. So like, I mean, I, I love fish. And like I said, I, I got into this hobby from finding Nemo. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really, it's really fun having all these different tanks. Cause then I can, you know, experiment, mm-hmm. experimenting super important to me. Cause you, you're, you're always trying to find something new and make your systems better in some way. And I think, you know, I guess my latest breakthrough for me is like this you know, feeding regimen, like yeah. this concoction that I put in my tank. Cause I was using all the products individually for years, but like I said, it's, you know, it's like raiding your fridge and eating a snack versus having a full meal. Yeah. yeah. And actually, um, before we close off, I wanted to ask kind of one more thing about that. And it's kind of like, I was thinking about your concoction being a little bit like, like kimchi or something like that, where it's like, <laughs> kind of almost like fermented, but the all of the bio of it, like all of the nutrients are still yeah. available. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it seems to be working for you. So I don't think you're losing any of those nutrients. No, yeah, I think it's it boils down to bioavailability, right? Yeah. And putting in like those coral foods in your tank and not seeing a feeding reaction is probably an indicator that it's not immediately bioavailable. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, something um, yeah. I understand too, but it's maybe another good example is um, uh, like a sourdough is um, yeah. I think easier for celiacs to have and they don't Digest, have as much of a reaction yeah. to it because part of that digestion process is already broken down for them. Right. That's true. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, another thing that I kind of been like thinking about is that a lot of our corals in the wild, they do not prey on dead matter a -hmm. lot of their food and intake comes from living plankton right or Mm -hmm. bacterial plankton or phycoplankton something like that yeah and we don't have access to that in our hobby or not readily and a lot of our uh, food products come in you know dead preserved forms Mm -hmm. and what is the closest thing that we can replicate to like their natural environment Mm-hmm. And I think the easiest way that hobbies can do it is through bacteria. Um, I think another big proponent of like the bacteria uh, method is uh, Sonny X uh, on Reef to Reef. I think he uh, he kind of gave me the impetus to kind of like go down this rabbit hole. Like oh, it always, um, you know, uh, I was always amazed by his tank and looked up to him and mm-hmm. his success and his seemingly like, you know, effortless approach. Mm-hmm. And I, I can see it now. I mean, my tank is very much pretty much effortless and mm-hmm. you can see it in my my icp results um your numbers don't matter like mm-hmm. running near 16 ppm nitrate and like 0. 0.4 0. 0.5 ppm of phosphate it's no sps keeper in their reasonable mind would ever let those numbers get that close to yeah. what i'm running yeah yeah not and intentionally that, that would not be and, what they would be oh, shooting for from the start <laughs> yeah exactly mm-hmm. and i mean when I started doing this, man, I was sweating bullets. I I never had my tank shoot up to a number that fast uh, or that high, and I was I was I was going insane for like that one day. Mm-hmm. But then I saw the next day the number drop, like it was like back to the baseline. Just got and used, I was like, utilized, converted. Yeah, it yeah. just got yeah. The corals just absorbed it all, and within the next week, after like a, a week of usage i saw new growth Mm -hmm. which was and not new growth on one specific coral it's tank wide yeah well that's like you were saying your calcium dropped like crazy faster than it ever had yeah Yeah. and my lps looked great Mm -hmm. my 
back rows were looking great. I mean, and like all of like the minor issues like cyano and some like little tufts of algae here and there pretty much like died back. I mean, I, I will say I have some algae. I mean, my tank isn't algae free, mm-hmm. but it's not like the the pain in the butt algae like uh, bryopsis or that like weird yeah. Yeah. green hair algae. It's like a little little bit here and there, but it's not like a forest in there of algae, you mm-hmm. know. And yeah. with the amount of food that I'm putting in my tank and like the the fish and everything, you would think you would think that's what my tank would turn into, like the Amazon rainforest of algae. Mm-hmm. But it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I, I feel like I took a lot out of this conversation. Uh, yeah. You, I, I, like I say, I like that you're doing experiments and, and uh, you know, cross-checking them too, because that gives us a little more uh, solid, solid-ish data to work on. So. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's super important, but I mean, I know a lot of people don't like reading scientific literature. It's very like loaded and... yeah just like upfront heavy and there's a lot of terminology that you don't know if you understand it properly or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, my experience and my ability to go to one of like a Princeton really allowed me to like build on myself, give myself that proper education and learn how to discipline myself and really get through these hard issues that you face. And, you know, that's what I took most from my education. Yeah, you know, yeah. discipline, determination, yeah. like a lot of th- a lot of problems that we face seem impossible. Even the thought of keeping a reef tank in your house seems impossible. Yeah, I mean, it did twenty five years ago, thirty years. Oh, ago. Oh yeah, not even yeah, not <laughs> yeah. not that long ago yeah. too. And when I have like people or guests over to my house, they're always amazed. Mm-hmm. And you know, they ask me if it's hard or easy to do. I can't give them no. you know an answer because it's <laughs> it's. You know, it's so hard to answer those type of questions. I, I would just easy. say it, it can be easy to do if you want to be passionate about it, if you think you're going to be passionate about it. If it's going to be one of those yeah. things that drives drives you and you love it, mm-hmm. then it can be mm-hmm. easy because it shouldn't feel hard if you're enjoying yeah, if it, you, right? Yeah, if you see the hobby as a chore, I don't think it's the right hobby for no. you. you know? <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you're doing something you love and you think it's, man, I don't want to do it, I got to do something else, it's taken this time out of my day that's it's not the right thing for you man mm-hmm. so yeah you definitely have to devote yourself this is like a hobby and a like a, a passion of love so if you if if you don't have that time and dedication this might not be the right thing for you but it's it's all mind mentality and mindset you know yeah. you put yourself in there and you want the best and you know you can do it and you have faith in yourself you can do it yeah, yeah. And well, and I think it's we can not impossible. we can assume most people listening to this podcast are probably pretty passionate about <laughs> reef keeping. Oh yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's good I hope advice. That, yeah, I hope that whoever listens to this, I mean, they can get some points or some new pointers that they can apply to themselves. Because I mean, I think one of my one of my the favorite parts for me of, of this hobby is to like help other people. I have a good friend that you know I met him at a frag swap, and. You know, he was just starting to get into the hobby and he had no clue on where to start. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much like took him under my wing and like taught him that all the things that I knew uh, helped seed his tank from my super established 20 something year old tank, gave him some rock from there, some water. And within a year, he's got a full blown reef tank. Yeah. SPS, LPS, like everything. His tank is doing fine. And he started following my uh, recipe for the concoction as well. And he's reported back. He said, everything looks great. Yeah. You know, no, it's great. So, You're a little vicarious, uh, live, live vicariously through people you advise a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, I, I love, I love to do that. You know, if like if someone's having problems and a lot of people do reach out just cause you know, I, I've been on the forums for so long and mm-hmm. I guess I've established this name for myself, like an SPS guru, but like a lot of people do reach out and they ask for advice. And I mean, I, I don't mind. I love to give out my thoughts and I always point them to my thread because there's a wealth of knowledge in there. And Mm -hmm. there's, I mean, there's a lot of eye candy as well. (laughs) Yeah. It's funny. I wonder if back in the early days, uh, some of those people knew they were talking to a 12 year old kid or (laughs) 13 year old. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I always wonder about that myself. I mean, it's like, you know, that's why I I use my dad's name. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like half the time no one would, if I told, if I went on the forum and said, I'm a 12 year old kid, and I'm doing mm-hmm. all this stuff. No one would take me with like any 
sense of like seriousness yeah. and they wouldn't believe anything I said. But like, I mean, I guess now I'm a little older. I mean, I'm not that old. I'm probably on the young side for people in this hobby. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's, you know, now I have that, you know, established credibility and people like actually take what I say with like some, you know, sense of like confidence. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's a good place to end. So um yeah thanks for making time and we'll do this again sometime hopefully we'll have some new funky thing to (laughs) explore yeah i hope so i mean this hobby is always evolving and you know at the rate of um where this hobby is going there's definitely seems to be more investment especially from private equity so there's more money being pumped into the hobby hopefully Mm -hmm. it'll make it better who knows yeah but there are a lot of you know there's a lot of different routes that this hobby can take and hopefully in the near future things get easier and not harder yeah you know? <laughs> i hope so <laughs> yeah cool yeah. man okay thanks so much well yeah anytime yeah okay i'll talk to you soon have a good night all right okay see you adam Bye. thank you for listening to this episode of beyond the reef with alan Vo, aka the coral reef tank Make sure you check out the Reef to Reef thread. I will put a link in the show notes and check out his Instagram at CRT underscore reefs. You can reach out to Alan via the Instagram or Reef to Reef if you're interested in purchasing corals from him or if you have a question, he'd be more than happy to help you out. And if you have any suggestions for future guests, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, Uh, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high-quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.